So our next speaker is a, a great friend. Um, I, I cannot express, as everyone has, how much we've learned from him, but uh, it's always fun to learn the history of how something came about, and rarely do we really get to talk to someone that's invented an operation. And although we call it the Latarge procedure, we really don't do anything about that procedure the way that Michel Latarge did, other than there's a screw. The procedure we do really should be called the Walsh procedure. So it's a great honor to introduce my good friend, Joe Walsh, who can tell us about the history of what is his operation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. It's already a great honor to be here and a great honor to be introduced by you. Um, no, it's not a Walsh procedure. It's, uh, we will see the different name we could give to this procedure. So this is my uh, disclosure, but there is nothing with regard to this talk. So TRIA was uh, really the first one to do, in, at least in France, some kind of surgery. It started in 1951, so three years before it published, to, to, to treat patients with anterior recurrent instability with a coaccurate process. Latage, the same year, reported about two cases treated recently and with a different procedure, and I will explain why. Then Elfet reported the Bristol procedure that he learned maybe in 1939 during the Second World War, and maybe, maybe Bristol used the coaccurate process before TRIA, for sure, and Pat, my mentor, I will explain to you why uh, is important also. So Albert TRIA reported in Lyon Lyon Chirurgical, it was a small uh, journal at that time, he reported about his uh, experience on uh, trading 17 cases since 1950 uh, or 1951, and uh, he reported the, the results of the TRIA procedure, which basically was medialization and lowering the subscapularis. You see here the principle of the surgery and the goal of Albert TRIA he was my mentor, I knew him, uh, I met him several times, I came in the US with him, and the goal of this surgery was to close the subcoracoid space. He said the head dislocate under the coracoid, so just let me try to close this space by lowering and medializing the coracoid process. And he described osteoclasia, meaning that it did not cut totally the subscap, the coracoid process. It just tried to remove, uh, to do a closing wedge osteotomy at the basis of the coracoid, just enough to medialize and to lower it. And this is a concept, and uh, this show you that uh, by uh, putting the coracoid lower and also by retentioning the full subscap and by pushing the subscap thanks to the conjoint tendon against the glenoid, that will avoid recurrent instability. Remember that that was almost 70 years ago. When I came back from the US in 1983, after visiting Frank Job, uh, uh, Mr. Tria allowed me to see, to call back all his patients, and he gave me 500 cases. Give, take all the charts and he say, okay, if you want to, to do some study about that, you can call my patient and see what happened. So I was allowed to call back the 500 patients operated by TRIA, and I was able to see 250 of them with a follow-up greater than 10 years. And you see the results. What was important for me is that I found 14% recurrent rate. Of course, Albert Ria was not very happy with that, but uh, he recognized that uh, uh, this surgery was not 100% success. And moreover, Henri Dejour, my boss at that time, because uh, Albert Ria was retired, said after this publication, okay, now if you want to change something to the TRIA procedure, you are allowed to change something. In Lyon, Michel Latarge was a general surgeon and uh, he described a different procedure. He was not a good friend of TRIA, as you can imagine, because TRIA was a very strong orthopedic man, and Michel Latarge was a weak 
uh, general surgeon. And uh, Michel Latarge reported at the, during the same, in the same journal, Lyon Chirurgical, reported two or three cases of this surgery. And he said, ah, I would like to present a new surgery, uh, uh, I imagine, for uh, recurrent arterial instability. And he presented exactly what you see on this drawing. That was in 1954. So the difference between TRIA and Latarge is very simple. TRIA recommended to do just closing wedge osteotomy at the basis of the coracoid, whereas Latarge recommended to do an osteotomy. And I learned later, later on from TRIA that Michel Latarge came in the OR one day to see what was doing uh, TRIA. And TRIA showed the surgery. TRIA was open mind and uh, teach, uh, taught everybody. And Latarge saw the surgery and he said, well, it's good, good surgery, so I'm going to try to do it. He went back in his OR, he took uh, osteotome and broke completely the coracoid. Now what? Give me a screw. Put the screw in, and that was a Latarge procedure. <laughs> and as you can imagine, Albert Trier was not happy at all. And he said, this is my surgery. He did not, he did not understand anything. He's a general surgeon. So Michel Latarge was a nice guy. He was uh, sports-oriented, family-oriented, uh, music-oriented and sur thoracic surgeon oriented. And I met him uh, at the end of his career in 1982 when he was a thoracic surgeon in the same uh, hospital. And he came later on to see me because he had AC joint arthritis and uh, he was happy to come and to discuss and uh, to speak about shoulder surgery. But he did not do, of course, anymore this surgery. So he was a very kind guy. And during the, upon the, year, the, during the year, 58, 61, 64, he reported almost always in Lyon Chirurgical, same review, different kind of procedure. Because, of course, he did change what he, he used to do at the beginning. And you see that in 58, he cut completely the subscap in order to see better. And uh, he also proposed to do some kind of tightening of the subscap putty plat procedure. So he was not really an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, also he had the idea for the first time to do this procedure. It, it was not really the father of this. And I would say that in Lyon, Tria was probably the father of that. Bristol also, Elfet reported that in 1939 he learned from Bristol how to cut the tip of the coracoid process and to suture the tip of the coracoid process inside the subscapularis. Completely different surgery. And May, Virgil May, was the first one in the US to report the use of a screw to fix the coracoid process. And then that was in 1970 in the US. But the Bristol procedure was a kind of transfer of the tip without any, uh, without any screw. Didier Pat was my mentor. And uh, uh, when I came back from the US, my boss, Henri Dejo, told me, you should go to Paris to visit Didier Pat. He does shoulder, he likes shoulder, and you will learn from him. And I said, well, OK. If, you, if I need to go, I, I will go. And I met a wonderful guy, a wonderful surgeon. And he took me this surgery, and uh, that was uh, the uh, PAT procedure. He proposed to put the coracoid process in the lying position, to put two screws, and also to suture the capsule to the stump of the coracoacromal ligament or to the congenital tendon at that time. But also, as you see, he split the, the superior part of the subscap. And that was described in France as a triple blocking effect, bony effect increase the anteroposterior diameter of the glenoid, ligament effect by suturing the capsule to the stump of the coracoacromal ligament, and the muscular effect with the inferior third of the subscap, which is the sling effect. Nowadays, we know that the sling effect of the subscap is the most important thing. And Nobu Yamamoto from Japan did a wonderful study at the Mayo Clinic 
showing that the true effect, the real mechanism of stability of the Latarge procedure is really the sling effect between the subscapularis intact tendon uh, muscle and the conjunct tendon. And if you remove this sling effect, thanks to the uh, conjunct tendon and in fair part of the subscap, you lose most of the stability of the Latarge procedure. So over the time, many different procedures have been done and basically every single surgeon changed something for the Latarge procedure. The coaccurate process positioning, the subscap approach, the capsule approach, the type of screw we use, whether the screw is unicortical, bicortical, with or without washer. There are about 100 different ways to do this coaccurate transfer and it's difficult to mix or to compare the results of, the, of each. What I have done, uh, I just learned it from uh, Didier Pat, and also when I visited Frank Job in 1983, I saw him many times doing the Bristol procedure, going through the subscap, doing the split. He just put the coaccurate in the standing position with one screw, and when I came back and, and when I was allowed to do finally the Latarge procedure in our department, I said, well, I'm going to do the PAT procedure, but we don't need to cut the superior part of the coracoid. Frank Job is able to do it without cutting the subscap, and I did not cut the subscap, and that is what I did for the last 30 years or so. So I did a huge number of cases. During this time, I tried also to do different kind of procedure, and including arthroscopic bank art, uh, according uh, to what was described in the literature at that time. And uh, I came back to the Latarge procedure because uh, the failure rate was higher. So we tried many times to report the results of this procedure. Now it's not anymore possible to call back 3,000 patients uh, because it's too much work to really uh, see the long-term results. But we try to honestly analyze our complication. I like to learn from our complication. And uh, so what are our complications? Com the main complication is indication. So if you propose to do a lethargic procedure just for a painful shoulder without true instability, clearly it does not work. In other words, if you just operate on a throwing shoulder because a throwing athlete because it is painful in the abduction extenuation and you believe that this is related to subtle anterior instability, latarge won't work. So latarge won't work to address painful shoulder in the throwing athletes. Clearly, we need to have typical bank heart lesion and ear sac lesion to make sure that it's true instability. Also, it, you should not do this surgery if you have to address older patients, older, greater than 60, for example, because the rate of complication is high. You can see this kind of static anterior translation of the human head. For whatever reason, I don't know. It happens in the older population. It can be also in fair static instability. I don't know why. The, on the right side, the patient did not have this in fair static subluxation before the surgery. And this was present after the surgery. Maybe it's because the subscap was less elastic and more uh, stiff, uh, was stiffer. I don't know. But this is clearly a contraindication uh, for me to do a uh, latarge procedure in this age group. This is also a typical case. This patient has no anterior instability. This is laxity. Or a joke, game, she play, she play a game or whatever. I don't know what. But I would not recommend to address this kind of patient with a, lat with a latarge procedure because it will fail. And I did it and I failed. So static anterior laxity is also typical. It's not instability, it's laxity. Translation of the humal head, asymptomatic, against the coracoid process. It's a muscular it's a cuff problem. It's usually related to massive rotator cuff tear. And definitely, you cannot address this problem by doing a latarge procedure. So there are some new developments regarding latarge because, of course, Surgery will not end in 1954, 
and uh, people, surgeons like Pascal Boileau and Laurent Lafourse were able to adapt the lethargy procedure uh, with a scope and uh, we organized in France several symposium uh, thanks to Laurent Lafourse and Pascal Boileau of course and in order to com to analyze and to compare the results of the arthroscopic lethargy against the open lethargy and uh, we were able to show that there was no significant difference between results of open and arthroscopic lethargy. So both of them work very well if they are done properly. Meaning that it's very important, I believe, the teaching. The teaching is crucial to learn how to do the arthroscopic lethargy, but it's also critical to learn how to do the open lethargy. And I'm not sure that the learning curve for the open lethargy is quicker than the learning curve to learn the arthroscopic lethargy. And at the end of the day, probably everything depends on your teacher, on your master. If you learn to do the lethargy with uh, Pascal Boileau, you will do a fantastic arthroscopic lethargy. Whereas if you learn to do the lethargy with me, of course, I will be better to teach open lethargy. But what we prove with this symposium organized in France with the French uh, so, uh, arthroscopic society, that results are, very, are good for both series. Of course, there is a learning curve, but again, there is a learning curve for the open lethargy. Here you see the major post-op complication, about a large number of cases uh, we did for this, uh, for this symposium, and we can tell that there is not much difference between arthroscopic and open, just depend on the surgeon. So, in conclusion, arthroscopic and open lethargy are both effective, reproducible, and there is a low rate of complication. So, in conclusion, lethargy procedure, we have to call it lethargy because he was the first one to, to report that in the literature. And it's safe and reliable, and Pascal already showed you this patient with 52 years follow-up after lethargy. I have another cases with 50 years follow-up after three-year procedure. Uh, unfortunately, this patient has arthritis, and that's the reason why I prefer to show this patient with 52 years follow-up after a surgery done by Michel Latarget himself. But Latarget is not a universal panacea, and uh, it should not be done after 60 years, uh, 60 years of age. Don't try to correct static or constitutional laxity with a lethargy because it does not work. Lethargy is designed to, to address instability. Shoulder going out. That is if, uh, for sure efficient, but it's not efficient to address laxity. I don't know, honestly, I don't know how to address laxity. Everything I tried, and I tried, everything failed. So it's not efficient to address painful shoulder in the throwing athletes, even though the patient complains of main symptom in the AB direction external rotation position. It is not instability. It's just painful shoulder or related to something else, but not to instability. If you do not have a typical bronchial lesion, if you do not have a typical lesion of instability, do not do the lethargy procedure. I don't know what to do, but don't do the lethargy procedure. And also, we can say nowadays that the under arthroscopy, it is safe, yes, it, it is reliable, it will be the future, it is the future, it is present also for some surgeon, and uh, I just strongly recommend that if you want to start to do either open or arthroscopic, you have to learn how to do it properly in order to avoid high rate of complication. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>